This past Sunday, as the sounds of a morning church service floated over the walls of the presidential compound, I asked President Mengistu to respond to that skepticism and to other questions about where his regime has been and where it is headed. He spoke in Amharic. Mr. President, welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. May I say how happy I am to have had this opportunity of meeting you here this morning. Mr. President, the widely held view uh, perpetuated by reports in the media is that this war has your government up against the wall. Is that wrong? This uh, situation in the North, this fighting, is a situation we inherited. It's not our creation. One should ask as to w what the origin of this is, what is the genesis. Of course, the purpose of the revolution was to provide a solution to the problem in the North, to this long-running struggle in the North. And immediately on the triumph of the revolution, we approached the dissidents in the North. They asked us to recognize their right to secede from Ethiopia. How can a government representative of the Ethiopian people allow this demand? And to allow the secession of this part of Ethiopia would be really to commit a national suicide. We did not want to do that. This is an endemically drought-stricken area in our country. And we have been approached by international donor organizations to provide food to them. So we said, OK, uh, food may come through th through the port of Masawa. And precisely as we're readying ourselves to provide food for the hungry, they tried to encumber uh, international passage. This is the second time they captured the port of Masawa, precisely I mean, timing it with a uh, drought situation in our country. But how do you respond to the criticism that both sides are putting military objectives before uh, consideration of, of starving people, that they, as you say, keep capturing the port and you keep bombing the, the, the port and, and including dozens and hundreds of tons of food uh, gets bombed as you attempt to recapture this port? It wasn't we who first bombed the city of Masawa. It was they in their effort to capture the port of Masawa that they have destroyed the port facilities and destroyed the whole city. That this uh, capture of the port of Masawa should come precisely at this very moment when uh, the port was most needed for the supply of food for the uh, hungry is uh, something that the international public opinion should have condemned. Why should the international donor community insist on the port of Masawa for the transport of the food there when there is an alternative route accepted by the Internet, by the United Nations and feasible one? We have used it in the past and we're using it now. So to insist that food must go through the port of Masawa is really uh, an effort to legalize the illegal capture of the port of Masawa, something which we cannot allow. I talked to uh, many people in your country since I've been here, and one, um, I should say, even highly placed Ethiopian told me this, we cannot win, and they cannot win, and all of us are becoming so exhausted and war-weary that all we have built up in the last 50 years is on the verge of being destroyed. Is he wrong? Uh, he's quite right. There can be nothing more lamentable than this. But the question is what to do about it. There are many observers who are saying that the situation on the battlefield has deteriorated to the extent that a military solution is close to impossible. Do you disagree with that? Hell no. Our option had never been military, and we firmly believe that the uh, solution lies in a peaceful dialogue in the problem in the North. So our opponents never thought that would be forthcoming. 
The uh, most anomalous thing in this that they have begun to harden their position to become more intransigent. The uh, talks uh, started only at the initial stage. I mean, only the preliminaries. Uh, the talks got stalled now because they didn't want to continue. So you're saying there are no new elements now in, in the equation? So there's an, uh, an, a new element uh, and because of their intransigence and inflexibility. The overwhelming impression is of a country that is impoverished, people who are starving, and political forces that don't really care. How do you counter that image? Does that worry you? The perception the world has of Ethiopia is not really the real per perception it ought to have given the mass media and the communication facility. In the first place, let me say we're not fighting only with these people who are directly opposing us with all the sophisticated weapons and with all the medicines and whatever it's, uh, it needs, where does it get it from? <laughs> Definitely it must be from forces, strong forces behind it that are providing it. And we're fighting against these forces. Which and countries are you specifically referring to? Well, some uh, of these countries have even, uh, you know, uh, far-reaching plans to destabilize uh, some African countries. And uh, uh, it is some Arab countries of the region. Of course, it's not all of them. I mean, some of these Arab countries. For example, Libya is spearheading this and others. Some of them are providing arms, and the others are providing uh, funds, and uh, so they are, they are involved in this hostile act in one way or another. But, but, but in that connection, um, there's a whole new concern arising with the Soviets pulling out of Ethiopia and ending its support to you. There are reports that Israel is now stepping in to fill that breach and that because Israel is stepping in to fill the breach in your country, the Arabs are responding to appeals from the opposition uh, forces. This allegation is entirely baseless. There is no truth in that we're trying to replace the Soviet, the Soviet Union with Israel. Uh, and that uh, we have uh, entered into a military pact with Israel. There's absolutely no ground for that. Your recent dramatic announcement of a new economic reform program which moved away from Marxism um, came um, as a surprise to many people. What was the objective of the socialist revolution in the first place? And what went wrong? Ethiopia has been basically a mixed uh, economy. And um, to give you a figure, 70% of the Ethiopian economy is privately owned. And 30% of that is owned jointly by the, gov by, by the state and cooperative sectors. On the whole, agriculture in our country can be said to be really very primitive. So we thought that it's only by meeting some prerequisites that we can introduce a degree of uh, modern agriculture in, in the country. That is, first of all, to um, uh, to settle the people, uh, to regroup uh, peasants in a specific area so that we could get uh, all things very easy, uh, get things through to them very easily. It was a non-ideological approach to introduce modern agriculture and modern technology rapidly in the rural area. Of late we have discovered and uh, that uh, this uh, did not help productivity. But specifically, what are you planning to do? People are waiting for, you know, what is the next step? Uh, because they, as I said, remain skeptical that you have announced reforms, but that 
the specifics of exactly how you plan to implement that are still the source of some confusion. Quite honestly, in the past there was nothing we did to promote the private sector, but now we've come out in grand style to uh, provide all types of assistance that the private sector would wish to have in order to develop agriculture and legal protection and so on. And then as far as the cooperatives, I mean, this law would provide that if the peasant farmers would like to continue as cooperative, they may do so. And if they don't, I mean, uh, the law would provide that they can uh, disband themselves and set up as private uh, uh, peasant farmers. How would you rewrite this chapter of Ethiopian history? I mean, a chapter which says, which often refers to you as the cruel dictator, Mengistu, uh, a man who refuses to allow political expression, who's, uh, you know, brutally suppressed dissent, um, and who is indifferent to human life. How would you rewrite that chapter? Go good down, Lamajamar. A man of the type that is made of, I mean, of this image in the first place would not be qualified. Uh, to come to power in Ethiopia. I mean, my personality, my nature, is judged by the Ethiopian people. What is paramount for me, as it is for the Ethiopian people, is the unity of the country, the sovereignty of the country. And I'm not ready to compromise on that. So uh, I personally do not want to see anything, I mean, die, I mean, uh, to kill anything, not even an insect. I do, really do not want to step on that. But the truth is that uh, I am not ready to compromise on the supreme interest of the Ethiopian people. How soon do you plan to put your government before the people? Do you plan, in, in, as you proceed with economic reform, to open up your system so that the people can vote? The armed forces uh, elected me to come and assume power, to take over power, precisely at the moment when the country was plunged in the deepest of anarchy. It was a time when the country was encircled by enemy forces. So its days uh, I mean, uh, of uh, uh, disintegration were numbered. So I was uh, elected uh, to take over power at my absence. I mean, to start off with, we did not set up a military junta, but what we did was, as soon as we came, just to go to the people and find out what they want and uh, to give us a mandate and uh, yes, what they so want us to do. So we put ballot boxes everywhere for people to give their views. So the people gave us their guidance. They told us what to do. So on the basis of this guidance given us by the people, we had to set up a provisional military government and uh, save the country from the danger which was hovering over it at the moment. So do you expect, do you envision any time in the foreseeable future that will, there will be opposition parties uh, able to contest uh, everyone participating in a process like that? But what any genuine Ethiopian must realize is that the unity and the social, well, the social uh, security of the country is paramount. This is one of the most ancient countries in the world, you know that. And this long past, Ethiopia never knew a party life. And the first party ever in Ethiopian history was set up by us. So this party is still at its initial stage, so it has yet to go uh, a long distance to mature as a party. It is we, this government, which for the first time introduced 
uh, a republican form of government in this country. Republic. There hasn't been a re any republic. Where's the Finland looking for government? And all this, all this uh, by the will of the people. Demo be mikat lo gizera mo ye bezo ham parti na ye mengustum bahrat malot ye tafal gando hana zipi chuna ye. So in the future, if uh, the need arises and if uh, actually situations justify uh, the emergence of multi parties, naturally we're flexible, we'll allow them to exist. Finally, Mr. President, let me just ask you um, as you reflect on all the things that we've talked about the war, the famine, the economic conditions in your country, the perception of the world outside. Do you yourself? at this point, looking back over all that, have any regrets about the past 15 years of your administration? Any, any things that you wish you could change? We have planned uh, in the past for the social and economic betterment of our people. And I must say that our performance in the past has been uh, really good and uh, I don't regret. There are no areas in which I say that our performance was poor, so I have no bad conscience at all. But of course, the most lamentable thing in this is that something I regret very much, that we did not have peace. My uh, grandparents did not know peace. My father did not, did not know peace in this country. And I don't know peace. And who knows, my child or my children also will never experience peace in our and I'm uh, very sorry about that. Well, Mr. President, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Charlene, for this interview.